Hello. We are announcing our 100,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. Special thanks to Galaxy Sabers for sponsoring this giveaway. We're giving away the Luke Skywalker Episode 6 lightsaber, Darth Maul, and the Vanguard lightsaber. All the details and pin comment down below, so make sure you go down there and sign up for the giveaway. I'll be announcing which video the giveaway will be in, in the community tab on the main page on the channel. Thank you all for getting us to this point, and I'll see you guys at 100k. Our story begins on Coruscant inside Padme's apartment. Anakin was zoned out, staring at a handheld tablet, when his wife walked into the room. Anakin was inquisitive and very quickly asked her if Obi-Wan had been here. She informed him that he had been. He wanted to make sure Anakin would be alright. Oddly, Padme never brought up how weird it was for Kenobi to just show up to her apartment, but for Anakin it was sort of an unspoken type thing. From Anakin's perspective, they both knew, but they never spoke about it, unlike how Anakin liked to tease Obi-Wan about Satine. Kenobi respected the secrecy between the bond of Anakin and Padme. For Obi-Wan, it was all about the fact that Anakin was happy. It was why he came here to make sure Anakin would be alright while he was on Utapau. The sentiment, while surprising, genuinely touched Anakin, made him feel like there was someone in his corner. Everything was going so awry and he didn't know what to do. His master shared some kind words with him before departing for Utapau, but it was very easy for Anakin to leave those moments behind and focus on the negative. Anakin and Padme had a short conversation before Anakin returned to the temple. Essentially, he promised her that he wouldn't let anything happen to her. The struggle for Anakin was all the breaking apart around him. Ahsoka was on Mandalore, soon to be fighting Darth Maul. Obi-Wan would engage General Grievous. Yoda didn't offer what he believed was helpful insight, and he was currently spying on the Chancellor. The reality is that Yoda actually did give him genuine useful information on how to handle death. However, for Yoda, letting go had become much easier over the years. His first master died before he was 100 years old. Most of his friends and teachers died before he was 150. When he finally became a Jedi Master, he watched his students and peers around him continue to die. As a sentient, he obviously attached himself to those people, and so he had to learn how to let go. Yoda at one point would become Grand Master and he would be responsible for watching over entire generations, being one of their many instructors and watching every single member of those classes achieve goals and then go into their own respective fields inside the Jedi Temple, before they did eventually die. Yoda understood how to let go of people as they transited into the Living Force. Truthfully, he believed he was helping Anakin out, and if Anakin learned how to let go, he wouldn't be plagued by this. But that wasn't the case. He was too attached, and therefore, he was confided in by Palpatine. It was odd how he brought up the entire thing about death, but Anakin didn't really question on how out of left field that story of Darth Plagueis the Wise was. Anakin assumed most people hadn't ever heard of the Sith, but Palpatine had to just have learned because he was an educated man. At least, that's what he chalked it up to. As Anakin made his way back to the temple, he thought about the conversations he had with those closest to him. Palpatine at the opera, Padme over the past couple days, Ahsoka before the Battle of Coruscant, Obi-Wan, and of course, Grandmaster Yoda. Maybe he was supposed to talk to someone else. He had the opportunity to confide in a number of council members that were currently still on Coruscant. Mace Windu, Coleman Cash, CC Tin, Agon Kolar, Shock T, and Kit Fisto. All of them were some of the best Jedi, and Anakin figured he might as well give this another try. Perhaps another Jedi Master had a better idea on how to approach this. He remembered overhearing a couple shinies in his unit talk about the wisdom and kindness displayed by General Shock Team. This sentiment was also shared by Echo and Fives, being that they interacted with her before the Domino Squad passed their trials and were sent to the Rishi Outpost. Anakin was originally going to go to the communication room and wait for updates from Kenobi and Ahsoka, but he wanted to give this another shot. The idea of Padme dying plagued not just his heart but his mind. He couldn't escape it. The visions or the nightmares or whatever they were sat present in his mind consistently. Though there was something important to note about Shock T, she had been rather quiet as of late, more so than usual even for her. Obi-Wan told Anakin before Coruscant that she was stuck in constant loops of meditations. She didn't really explain it to him. She couldn't escape them either, and she was staying inside her room to continue meditating. Shock T had one of the best meditation chambers in the entire temple. It wasn't even technically a meditation chamber, it was just her room. But she soundproofed every inch of it. When that task was finished, she also put some of her own personal artifacts into it to encourage the usage of the light side. There were heirlooms from the Tukrutha people that had high connections to the Force. Most of these were passed down from generation to generation inside the temple amongst the Tukrutha. The previous one was Jura Mali from the High Republic. Shakti would have passed hers down to Ahsoka before she passed away. If there wasn't another Tukrutha to pass them down to, then she would just keep them in the restricted section of the Jedi Archives, so that another Tegruta Jedi Master may collect them and use them in the future. Regardless, Shock T's room was a hive of the Force, and it was completely soundproof as to avoid any unnecessary distractions. Anakin buzzed her room, which was the only audible thing to get through the silence. She used the Force to open the door panel, while her eyes were still shut. 
Anakin looked in and saw Master T facing him. She asked him to come in, calling him by his name. He apologized for interrupting and she made no note of that, asking what was troubling his heart. He explained that he was having visions or nightmares. He was unsure. Shocked, his eyes opened. She had been having similar struggles. She asked him of what, and he told her, death, pain, suffering. Shocked, he didn't ask if it was anyone he knew or not. She knew why he was here. It wouldn't be worth asking him that question, so instead, she asked that he come and take a seat in front of her. They could kneel together and speak about it, so Anakin slowly walked down to the spot in front of her and sat down. Shocked, he took a deep breath. The smell of incense burning inside the room filled Anakin's mind with a sense of peace and serenity. She told him that all of those emotions were natural, death, pain, and suffering were all natural within life, and with the war, they were bound to happen. She then noted that she didn't believe his visions had to do with the war, so she asked him what they were about, or who they involved. Anakin was quiet, not wanting to reveal the secrecy of his marriage to Padme. Shakti could see the hesitancy coming out of Skywalker, so she told him that she could potentially help him in a different way. Anakin nodded his head, hoping that this would be more efficient and wouldn't require him giving up any information. He wouldn't have to do anything, truthfully, aside from just sit right where he was. He asked her what she meant, and she was very gently speaking to him as she told him to join her in a meditation. Skywalker just found this to be odd. How would that help with his little dilemma? Maybe a meditation would do him well. He didn't really know because he never did it. Anakin was big in telling someone he definitely did it, even though he definitely did it once when he was younger and thought it was boring. Perhaps Jacques too would be able to provide some adequate insight into doing a proper meditation, or even helping him understand the future, just without, you know, breaking the code. Shakti pressed a small button down beside her, and a table lifted up between the two of them, and she reached out her hands towards him. It was a gesture that requested, without words, that he put his hands in hers, so naturally he did. She took his hands and gently placed them down on the table. Using the force, she waved some smoke across the table, allowing it to hide their hands from sight. She then pulled her hands off of his and laid them on the outer edge of the table. She then requested that Anakin feel through the force and close his eyes. Shakti could feel the room illuminate with his power in the force and then their meditation began. At the same time, Mace Windu received a word from Commander Cody that Obi-Wan had engaged General Grievous. Because Skywalker wasn't present, he decided that he would inform the Chancellor about everything he just learned himself. He requested for Agon Kolar, Stacey Tin, Coleman Cash, and Kit Fisto to come with him. There wasn't really a need to show this much force with Palpatine, but Windu wanted to make it very clear to the Chancellor that the democracy of the Republic would not be disrupted by him. Shortly after Windu and his squad left, Master Yoda saw Ahsoka Tano fill in for where Commander Rex was. Rex told the Communication Council that he would retrieve her. Anakin and Mace weren't present, so she could really only speak to Yoda. Their conversation was a little longer, but the only real topic of conversation would be in the fact that Maul believed Anakin had some sort of importance to the Sith Lord. To Yoda, this was concerning, but with every council member on Coruscant preoccupied, he couldn't really bring this issue up to anyone who could do anything in the present. This left a sense of panic within him, and he had to make a decision. Would he leave Master Luminar and Dully in charge of the defense operation, or would he reroute to Coruscant before the battle began? He didn't have much of a choice either. The Separatists were powering up their battalions of droids and preparing for the attack. Instead of Shakti's room, Anakin and her were sitting in silence. The incense in the room filled their noses and they dug deep into the forest. Shakti had been using meditations increasingly over the last three years, but even more so in the last couple months. They were both connecting to each other as they were getting closer to Anakin's visions and nightmares as they started to become readily available. And then he realized what Shakti was doing. She was using him as a source to pull from what he had received. She thought he understood that this is what would happen. Skywalker tried to pull away from the vision, but he couldn't. They were interlocked in a binding of the Force, so that she could actually best understand and help him. She spoke aloud to him, not realizing that he was pulling away. It was a culmination of effects. Sidious was attempting his last push on Skywalker as Mace and the Jedi arrived. Anakin was trying to pull out of the vision, and Shakti was in total harmony and balance with the Force, so that she could help Skywalker. When she spoke out, Anakin's mind spun as panic began to set in for him. He wanted to tell her to stop and fear that she would remove him from the Jedi Order. She would figure it out, and then he would have nothing. He wouldn't have anyone to help him, and he would be lost. I see. I see someone very close to you dying in childbirth. Master Kenobi is also present with this woman. However, something feels off. Everything about the vision feels fabricated. Did you lose someone else after experiencing visions like this? I did, Master Shakti. Something about this feels wrong, Anakin. This vision isn't natural. It doesn't align with the Force, as if the vision is meant to pull you from your path. I see that this birthing process is one of death, but not one of natural causes. Wait, these are visions about your wife? 
Anakin was silent for a moment. He was reluctant when he answered her before, but now he was trembling. The ruse was exposed, and what would become of him? His eyes opened as he looked at Shakti, her face covered in peacefulness. She didn't open her eyes or even try to get up. She was just pondering through the Force, and then she spoke up, again. Please, close your eyes, Anakin. I need you to trust me. If I am to help you, I need you to be a part of this. Skywalker took a deep breath, preparing to get up. His hand drifted backwards from the table, and then he saw Shock T's hand sitting there idly. She wasn't trying to pull him away from his wife, and she wasn't trying to do him an injustice. She wanted to truthfully help. Assuming that Shock T would address the wife's situation in the future, he closed his eyes and rested his hand back on the table, connecting himself to the Force once again. Thank you, Anakin. I have to be honest with you. These dreams and all visions do not come from the Force itself. They come from an external source, one that is unnatural to the Force. I'm not sure if anyone else knows of your marital situation, but if they do and they have a grounding in the dark side, then they could be trying to hurt you. Do you know anyone with connections to the Sith? I don't believe so. What would be an example? It could be someone who was close to Count Dooku. It could also be someone who has the ability to recall stories of the Sith and knowledge of their religion. One does not simply know the Sith without having interacted with them or being them. Chancellor Palpatine told me last night of a story revolving around a Sith legend. Shakti opened her eyes and Anakin did the same. She knew about the mission, but she didn't want to make any assumptions about it. They looked at each other for a moment and then Shakti told Anakin that she would like to continue their meditation requesting that he not move. He didn't, but she got up, moving towards a corner of the room and opened a drawer. She pulled a couple of objects out and then walked back over to the seat gently and putting herself in front of Anakin. She handed him a small kyber crystal, requesting that he put it into his dominant hand, and then she laid a small cloth over his left hand. She expressed that in the ancient days of the Jedi, before the first schism, it was how the Jedi were able to encounter beings of unknown abilities and powers. It's how they expanded their relationship to the Force in the ancient days. Before they went on, Anakin asked why the Jedi didn't use these anymore. She laughed a little, telling him that the Jedi still used them, it just wasn't every Jedi. Most of the Jedi who still had a connection to the Force like this were either on a bearish vow, or priests and priestesses inside the temple, reminding him that not every Jedi was a warrior. He then persisted to ask why the Jedi Council didn't use such methods. She expressed that it was a convoluted answer, but it was because to have an order so large in Coruscant required the Jedi to have political interests. She didn't agree with it either, but she understood why it happened. It didn't make it right or wrong, it was just the way the order developed over the years. Anakin just nodded his head, and the two of them delved into the meditation some more. Shakti had been using these type of meditations to try and figure out who the Sith Lord was. Her motive of inspiration was the missions Yoda had been on a couple months beforehand. It caught her attention, and it worried her. She noticed how Yoda was seemingly off, and got to a point where he was aware of what could happen, but then, out of fear, didn't act. She was hoping they could at least act now, and Skywalker might be able to assist her in finding the path to reaction and potentially saving the Jedi. Inside the Chancellor's office, Mace informed Palpatine that General Grievous had engaged General Kenobi. Palpatine noticed the five Jedi in his office and found it to be a threat. He noticed that Skywalker was nowhere to be seen, and judging by the use of his most recent Force vision, he wasn't coming to his side. Sidious was hoping he could sway Anakin over with the visions, but instead, he sent the Jedi Council. However, Despite them being really present in force, they seemed unaware of who he was, as if Anakin hadn't said anything. Despite their belief that he was a Sith Lord, they didn't have any concrete evidence to support it, so their main concern was him keeping too much power in the Senate. If he kept too much power, then he could take over the Galactic Republic. As the Jedi left unsuspecting of anything, Commander Fox and a number of Coruscant Guardsmen approached them. Without any warning, they fired. Coleman Cash was dropped first as the other four Jedi ignited their weapons, Sacy Tin being kicked in the neck and falling over as the three Jedi retreated back to the Chancellor's office to protect him. They had no reason to believe he had done this, and instead, they saw it as a clones committing treason. As they locked the doors, Mace Windu was killed with a lightsaber through his back. Kit Fisto and Agnon Kolar turned around with shock on their face as they tried to defend themselves, but they were thrown back and cut down within milliseconds of them realizing that Sidious was indeed the Sith Lord. Sacy Tin was executed in the hallway, and Commander Fox came in to make sure the Chancellor was alright. Sidious nodded his head, informing his loyal subjects that the Jedi were trying to take over. Commander Fox asked what to do, and Sidious told them to lock down the executive building. Order 66 subsequently went out across the galaxy. General Grievous and Obi-Wan, who were engaged in battle, became targets of the clones and they were both left in confusion. 
Obuan, using his defensive form to defend himself as both generals took the moment to stand together. That is until Obuan crippled Grievous by slashing him across the back and disappearing, allowing him to be a distraction for the clones. It was a bit cruel, but Obuan was confused and trying to understand what was happening. It was the best way to save the clones and himself, being that Grievous wouldn't be able to defend himself or kill any clones with a hole in his back. Inside Shakti's room, she and Anakin were feeling closer and closer to see if it was indeed Palpatine who was doing this. They used Anakin's visions and a couple of powers Shakti knew to draw into the visions. She was getting close with Yoda's own versions of these, however with Skywalker present it was much easier. If Anakin had come a couple days earlier, they could have figured this out before Yoda or even Obi-Wan left Coruscant. However, that wasn't going to be the case as they continued going through until they came across the Dark Lord of the Sith standing over an altar inside the industrial sector, putting these nightmares into Skywalker's mind. They both opened their eyes and shot to see how distraught Anakin was. His eyes watered. He felt so betrayed. He was worried for his wife, and he wanted to save her, and now his mentor was trying to actually take advantage of him. Sidious was putting these nightmares into his mind, when, at least according to Shakti, they weren't at all plausible in the real world to happen, considering they were made up. Anakin stood up and walked towards the door. Shakti rushed to her feet and placed her hand gently onto his shoulder and asked him if he was okay. He looked back with tears in his eyes. He told her he didn't know what to do. She told him that she would inform Master Windu. She wouldn't bring up anything regarding his family, but they could use these visions as a means to inform him of Palpatine's usage of the dark side of the Force. He was the Sith Lord, and he needed to be stopped. Anakin was so disoriented. He looked to her and then nodded his head. She put another hand on his shoulder and told him to trust. If not the Council, then her. If not her, then the Force. She understood he was conflicted at the moment, but it would be okay. As long as he trusted something or someone who wanted only the best for him, then he would be alright. The Jedi, the Counselor herself, nor the Force wanted Anakin to suffer. They wanted only the best for him. If he could trust that, then everything would be alright. Anakin smiled and the two of them embraced each other for a short moment. Shakti telling Anakin that she would inform Master Windu. If he wanted, he could stay here. The smell of incense still present and he decided that he would stay. A sense of resolve filled his heart as he watched Shakti open the door and as she did, a thermal imploder blasted off in front of the door panel. Both Shakti and Anakin were flung backwards as the walls of the room caved in and buried them alive under the rubble. Anakin was awake enough to keep the debris from crushing them alive. From his point of view, he could see the Jedi Temple hallway and he watched chaos unfold. He rushed to move but his head had been hit and he was fading out of consciousness. Just before his eyes closed, he saw Sindrog leading a group of temple guards on a counter-offensive. Just as he was, one of the guards thrust their pike through his back before challenging his brothers and sisters as the clones came in running for support. The temple had fallen. When the morning came, smoke filled the air. The smell of incense had died out, and the two Jedi in Shakti's room teamed together to get themselves an opening to crawl through. Anakin's initial worry was Padme, but upon seeing the wreckage done to the Order, he realized that she likely was not targeted by Palpatine. The two of them looked at each other as they climbed out of the rubble. It was devastating. They looked on in horror as they checked on the bodies of the dead. There wasn't any movement. Every single Jedi inside the temple was seemingly dead. Shakti told Anakin to look for survivors, but keep close in case there were, well, in case there were any more clones looking to harm them. That was a hard statement to get out for her. She was with almost every single clone at one point or another, and then they slaughtered the Jedi like they were nothing. How could they do this? Neither Anakin nor Shakti considered what Fives mentioned as they scanned the area. It was heart-wrenching. They couldn't believe what had happened, and as they continued along, Anakin saw a group of younglings, and before his heart could sink, anger rose from within. So much fury, so much disgust. If it was the last thing he could do, he would gut Sidious. The two Jedi searched for several minutes, trying to contact other Jedi Masters, but they got nothing. With the all-clear signal set by the Grand Inquisitor, a couple Jedi were able to return. Because of how early Order 66 went off, a number of other Jedi were able to survive. Plo Koon was the first to return to Coruscant, followed by Yoda who was already en route from Kashyyyk. Behind him was Aayla Sakura and Obi-Wan Kenobi. The last of the bunch was Kiari Mundi who survived his encounter with the Galactic Marines before returning to Coruscant. When the five Jedi returned to the temple, they found Shakti and Anakin burying the bodies of the dead. Anakin contacted Padme and requested that she leave the planet as soon as she could. She was already planning on doing that, considering it seemed as if Representative Jar Jar Binks sent another Jedi away on his personal vessel to save him from the Empire. Regardless, Padme would be going to her family estate to stay hidden. While she wasn't totally on board with just leaving, Anakin made a convincing case, using the nightmares and what he and Shakti discovered. Considering the clones wiped out most of the temple, she quickly vacated the planet. 
When the other five Jedi returned, they made a decision that they would make a move on the Chancellor. It was the best move to make. However, Yoda was adamant that he would go in alone. He didn't want anyone getting killed on the fight, though the other Masters were determined to be a part of this. The reason Yoda wanted to fight Sidious alone made sense. He knew this would be a match of the most powerful beings in the galaxy. However, he understood that his peers, if they were with them, he would be distracted by their presence, and that was a risk he couldn't afford to make. If his peers were there, then he would try and save them and instead of focusing on the fight at hand. Also, Yoda believed that with so many figureheads of the Jedi Order, they needed to round up the survivors and get them off-world. If there were any on Coruscant or anywhere else, they needed to be redirected. That was a fair directive, and so Yoda went off to fight the Sith Lord, as shocked King Anakin went to the archives to recalibrate the system to warn all survivors of the Purge. On the other hand, Mundi, Ayla, Plo, and Kenobi would split off and regroup with the Jedi far away from Coruscant. The planet they decided would be best for was Naboo, mostly due to his distance from Coruscant, but also because its senator was an ally, just like Bail Organa but Alderaan's too close. All the Jedi believed that Yoda would defeat Sidious, and they would be wrong. The coming days would be filled with disappointment and tragedy. Thanks to the Jedi survivors, they were able to save just about every survivor of the Purge, but Yoda lost his fight with Sidious, which only encouraged harsher action against the Jedi. But Sidious won. He destroyed the Order, and he was a new Emperor of the Galaxy. It left Anakin with serious regret. He wished he had gone the Shakti earlier. If he had, maybe they could have stopped Order 66 and the Rise of the Sith, though Padme was back in the Senate trying to help. She was already forming the blueprints of a resistance against Palpatine, and she wouldn't let that slip away. She only returned to the Senate once the children were born. It was pretty much impossible to keep a secret at this point. With Obi-Wan and Shakti supporting Anakin's side of things, through it, Yoda and Mundi couldn't really get angry or anything. Anakin's actions were mature, and despite breaking the code to be with Padme, him talking to Yoda and Shakti about his visions were the correct thing to do. It just meant that now the Jedi needed to resist the rise of the Empire. Luckily, they didn't have to worry about too much aside from Sidious. There was Grand Inquisitor, and there were a couple more clones, but Maul had been killed on Mandalore, after Ahsoka narrowly escaped the clones due to Bo-Katan. However, because the Mandalorians helped Ahsoka, they were all subsequently slaughtered. A fair fate for those consumed by war. Ahsoka would find a way to find her former teacher, and the shambles that the Order was currently in. There was a feeling of defeat in the atmosphere, but none more than Yoda. He'd become nearly a hermit. None of the Masters had ever seen Yoda so catatonic in their lives, but he was responsible for what had happened. He couldn't bear to look the younglings and former Padawans in their eyes. He was supposed to be what every Jedi grew beyond. But what was there when he was the greatest failure the Order had ever seen? Masters Plo, Shock, T, and Mundi took up leadership roles of the Jedi, with Yoda's absence being very present. The lack of leadership from him led to a lack of confidence in the younger Jedi. Ayla and Obi-Wan had confidence, but they were also trying to maintain the stresses of saving any other Jedi lost amongst the stars. Anakin, on the other hand, was semi-absent. Luckily, he had Padme's family who was very supportive and loving towards him, which helped him handle the raising of Luke and Leia while Padme was on Coruscant. Though a defining characteristic within Anakin was becoming more and more prevalent, the darkness was rising and he couldn't keep it back because he was so focused on killing Babatim to seeking revenge. The only way to get out of that mindset was finding peace, because finding peace wasn't the same thing as finding happiness, which is where Master Shock T once again came in. She went to Anakin one evening, Skywalker had a schedule, and it was agreed upon by the other masters. He would spend the first several hours of every morning with his children, come back to the little area set up for the Jedi, and then when it was late afternoon to early evening, he'd go back for an hour or two before sleeping where the Jedi were. This particular evening, Anakin was sitting out in the field alone, which wasn't uncommon for him, but he was extremely restless. He was attempting to meditate to find some semblance of peace, but he wasn't getting there. The Jedi had been teaching him how to be more effective in combat. Mundi and Plo would grill him all day when he was with them. If Yoda failed, then they needed all their members to be stronger, especially in a confrontation with Sidious. Skywalker would need to be at his very best. Regardless, shocked, he noticed what everyone else did. She just had the best means to addressing it within Skywalker. She came up behind him and placed her hand on his back to make sure he knew she was the one coming. He addressed her and he opened his eyes as she walked around in front of him and knelt down just as they had inside of a room inside the temple. Anakin, you're struggling with the dark side again. What can I do to help you resist it? How can I not resist it, Master? The Empire rules over the galaxy. My wife is on Coruscant fighting for something that can't even breathe. Master Yoda is nowhere to be seen, and the rest of the Jedi are dead. What am I supposed to do? Come to peace with it, Anakin. How can I come to peace with something so unnatural? You ask the impossible of me. This isn't a happy place, Master. It's a place full of terrified children. 
stressed adults, and no hope for the future. I said come to peace with it, not be happy with it. You put too much weight on your shoulders, Anakin. If you carry the weight of the universe on yourself, you can never be what you were meant to be. If you never find peace within yourself in this moment, you will never be prepared for what you must face. And what am I meant to be, Master? The Chosen One. The one meant to bring balance to the Force. Anakin looked at her with wonder in his eyes once again. She smiled in a very similar way as to before. She took his hands and placed them on the grass in front of him, implying that he should feel through the Force. It took some time, but they were eventually able to find their peace. Learning to come to terms with what had happened, and with their acceptance, they were able to finally move forward. If Anakin continued dwelling on something so far out of his control, then he would never be what he needed to be, not just for himself, but for those around him, and those who meant the most to him. By the time the Jedi believed they were ready, the Empire had become a totalitarian state. Without an enforcer, Sidious was even more paranoid, and he was gunning for anyone and everyone he could. His attempts at building a contingency plan were in full effect, but nothing would ever stop the rise of the Jedi Resistance. He couldn't find it, and Grand Inquisitor wouldn't be able to do anything. Not for nothing, there wasn't anyone willing to join the Inquisitorius, mostly because all the Jedi had been secured and brought back to that boom. All of their traitorous thoughts being quelled by Obi-Wan, Ayla, or Plo, who were spending a majority of their time with the students. Grand Inquisitor would be killed by Balin Skull and Ahsoka Tano at one point. When the time came, not more than five months after the Purge, the Jedi moved for the Empire. Yoda had gone into exile, so it was Plo, Shakti, Kiade Mundi, Anakin, and Obi-Wan. Ayla was still a knight, much like Anakin, but she didn't believe she was ready for the confrontation, not wanting to slow her allies down, and decided against going. So, without their Grand Master, five Jedi went to fight the Emperor, to destroy the Sith, and to reunite a defeated galaxy. The trip through hyperspace was quiet, there wasn't much to be said. Many of the Jedi present knew that they wouldn't be returning back with each other. It would be the largest test of their strength collectively. If they didn't risk it all to defeat the Sith, then it wouldn't be worth it. None of it would be. There was obvious disappointment in Yoda being so lost since his previous interaction with the Sith. But the Jedi couldn't forfeit this moment. They had each other, and that had to be enough. Sidious had already done so much damage, they couldn't let him do more. The Jedi arrived under the cover of darkness, just after a late night meeting Sidious had inside the Senate building. Because of Padme being so integral in the race against the Empire, Sidious was actively trying to disband large pieces of the Senate. It was working too. With so much power, they couldn't resist, unless they joined up with Padme. Many of the Senators liked the power they had, but now it's becoming obvious that they would lose it if they continued to support Palpatine. He was one more bill away from erasing all the power from the Galactic Senate. He sat inside of his office, laughing to himself, when he heard the sound of lightsabers ignite and he looked up to see the Jedi. They'd come for him. He was surprised to see so many, with so much talent, having survived the Purge. It had to have been the timing of the execution. It wouldn't matter though. What wasn't finished by the clones would be finished by him. He stepped up from behind his desk, each of the Jedi raising their weapons to defend themselves. And then, he came for them. They moved to defend themselves. His strikes were precise, and quick. But these were four masters, each of them the best of what they did. Both Shock, Team Kadimundi, masters of Form 4. Both Plo Koon and Anakin, either masters or proficient in Form 5, and Obon was the key to everything. He was the greatest master of Form 3 the Order had ever seen. He used it as if he had created it. It was weak against Form 2, which is why Dooku was so efficient against him. However, Sidious utilized both 7 and 4 the most, and with so many opponents, he wasn't really even thinking about it. Sidious loved the challenge though. While he liked to think of the lightsaber as a barbaric weapon used only by the Jedi, he'd make them suffer because he, in his mind, was greater than all of them. Yoda was fortunate to escape, but these Jedi would not. Yoda mentioned how Sidious beat him, and as the five Jedi fought with Sidious, Mundi used the force to throw Sidious' pod off his axis as it slammed into the wall. They were trapped, Anakin blasting the door behind them to make sure Sidious needed the win against all five opponents if he wanted to actually escape. The Jedi were incredibly quick, their lightsabers moving aggressively. Obi-Wan was taking a great deal of the defensive fight, especially with Sidious using two blades. But each of the aggressive masters countered that to perfection. Sidious was coming within inches of striking each Jedi, but due to the sheer number of them and their confidence in each other, they worked in perfect alignment. Mundi had the perfect balance of aggressive assault, while Shock T's aggressive assault was regulated to passive attack. Plo's strength was defining as a Kelt door, and with Anakin backing them up and strength with his own, mixed with his speed, they made a fierce duo alone. And with Obi-Wan's ability to block any and everything, there was nowhere for Sidious to go. The Jedi pressed and pressed. It was impossible to land a strike on Sidious. They all tried, but he was too fast. The darkness aided him in every aspect of the fight. Skywalker saw it. 
the opening. He pressed forward, giving Sidious an advantage. At the same time, Shock T, who was more connected to him at the moment than anyone else, did the same thing. Their blades slammed against Sidious's, and as they did, Plo smashed his hand forward into Sidious's chest. He couldn't do anything but be destroyed. It was quick and painless, but it was the light side of the force committing to balance by destroying the darkness. The day was won, but the war was not. There was so much that needed to be done, and while Padme and her caucus hadn't openly supported the Jedi, they used the little destruction of Sidious to fuel their victory in the Senate. There'd be no reinstitution of the Republic, but the Empire would fly colors of democracy, similar to the one that stood before the Clone Wars. However, faceless corporations would lose all foothold in the Senate, and there'd be no chance for any individual to achieve as much power as Sidious once held. It became unattainable as a goal, if anyone even dared to do what Sidious did. He still had loyalists, those who still supported taking over the Republic, however, the popularity, similar to their ideals, would die out for how inefficient it was. With Padme leading the charge, the Empire would be in good hands once it slowly climbed out of the hell it was submerged into. On Naboo, the five Jedi, all of which were masters, at least according to Mundi, Plo, Obi-Wan, and Shakti, effectively removed Yoda from the Jedi Order, because despite Anakin's attachments, he showed more dedication to the Order and to the galaxy than the Grand Master did. While the Four would still consider Yoda a friend, they believed he was not what the Jedi needed now or possibly ever again. He was not to be instructing or anywhere near this new Jedi Order. Instead, the Jedi would move to a planet not far from Naboo, just for Anakin. It was found by Jocasta Nu, who'd been raiding the Jedi Archives for the last couple months. The Jedi would relocate to the Runa Jedi Temple on Talam. It was close to Naboo, and it was a maintained temple that would be outfitted for the rebuilding of the Order. Anakin would raise his children with Padme, but he would also raise his children with the Jedi. Due to Padme's dedication to public service, she would ensure the Empire was structured around a sound system. Despite how important family was to her, she wanted to be sure the galaxy could recover before her children were of age. With Anakin bringing Luke and Leia to Coruscant, Naboo, and Talam, he would get to spend time with them, but also enjoy the pleasantries of both aspects of life. He'd have the order of which he loved, but he would also have the family of that he loved. Skywalker would be a part of the restructured Jedi Order, one with no Grand Masters and only five Council members. At the center of the Council was the Headmaster, which currently sat Shock Team, for her work and actions in not just defeating the Sith, but bringing peace to Anakin Skywalker. As the years went by, the Jedi passed from natural causes. Anakin would also find his role as a Headmaster, overseeing a new generation of Jedi, as Luke and Leia looked to inspire the hope that both their parents had established. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William, 1767, Darth Revan, Granddaddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Anakin Stink, Runner, CT7567, Oz of Oz, Darth Nox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Jenny Deguin, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallig, Mad Men Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forda's Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, the man with three first names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. If you want to support me in other ways, go check out the Patreon. There are super, super duper cool updates on there. Also, don't forget to check out the lightsaber giveaway, giving away three after we hit 100,000. I will announce the video in the community section. So let's talk about the story. I wanted this to have the Revenge of the Sith feel to it, but I also wanted to have Anakin's growth as an individual very present in it. I think doing this with Shock T was the best way to accomplish this. The idea being that if Anakin had gone to her instead of Yoda, she would have helped him go through it, which is why at the end of the story, she's technically like the Grey Master, the Headmaster as I called her. So I thought giving like that extra incentive for the, the story to kind of go down a darker route, but also know that it could have gone down a lighter route had Anakin gone to Shock T instead of Yoda. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.